Hello, my name is Jeremy Barnes, and if you see me look away or anything like that, it's because my allergies are bothering me pretty bad today, but I'm here to do the Thor Love and Thunder review. Um, it will be spoiler free for the beginning part of it. And I'm just going to break the movie down into the, each section that I feel is worth noting. And then it'll be a spoiler talk at the end. So I'm going to start first with um, my overall thoughts about the movie. I have seen it uh, twice now. The first time I liked it, it was different. Like It was kind of an interesting feeling. I enjoyed myself the whole time. It was a really fun movie. Um, a lot of uh, comedy just like in Ragnarok. Um, I don't like it as much as Ragnarok, which even that movie I didn't like as much as a lot of other people ha uh, like it. Um, for me, it, it's kind of like middle tier Marvel. This one is uh, below that. Still, I would say middle tier. It's not bad, um, but not as good as Ragnarok for sure. Um, there was nothing that I didn't like about it. It was just that it didn't like reach the highs that a lot of Marvel movies have reached. Um, so that's the only reason why it's not higher on my ranking. Um, so I'm going to first start with the story of the movie. And I would say that this story is about Thor finding his next purpose in life after doing everything he thought he ever wanted to or needed to do in his life. And he finds his purpose through love. Um, and through that, there's a little bit of rom-com elements with him and his former lover, uh, Jane Foster, from the first two Thor movies. And I would say that Jane is a secondary protagonist of this movie, so she has a, a slightly different story. And I feel like her story is one of purpose, fulfilling her goal of saving the world, which she's attempted to do throughout her life using science. Um, but in this movie, she achieves it through love. And this is love for Thor. And then through that, it spreads to others as well. Because love is an infectious thing. And this movie is called Love and Thunder. So that is definitely one of the major themes of this movie. And it's different types of love as well. It's not just romantic love. Um, so I thought that was really cool. The next thing I'm going to talk about are the characters of the movie, beginning with Thor Odinson himself. And I, I would say that uh, Thor, you know, if you've seen his journey throughout the MCU, uh, he's always been kind of a, a fish out of water. And when he started, he came to Earth uh, without his powers. He was figuring himself out and regaining his worthiness. And he always thought he wanted to be the king, but after like actually getting there, after the first Avengers movie, um, he decided he actually didn't want that really. He just wanted a uh, more of a kind of warrior life, but also even to kind of settle down a little bit with Jane in that movie. Um, and. He's had the few adventure adventures with the Avengers, um, but in Ragnarok, when he actually was forced to be king, he still didn't really like like the idea of, of doing that, and um, we see an end game that. Like through the time travel mechanics of the movie when he gets to say uh, his last goodbye to his mom and she tells him that it's okay to fail because he failed with Thanos and that what really measures a person is how well they succeed at being who they are and Thor never really was that so that's why he, he goes on this adventure with the Guardians at the end of the, of the movie but I would say that um even doing that, he still is kind of lost when this movie starts. 
um, and he's not having as much fun as I think he was anticipating he would have with them. But I'll talk more about that later. Um, the only other thing I would say is that in this movie, Thor kind of seems at like a, a resting place, like almost like this is the end of his, his story. And he's kind of at a place that is uh, similar, I think, to Captain America, where it's like a retirement phase for him. Um, but we'll see what happens with him in the future. So the next character is Jane Foster, who, after gaining the power of Thor in this movie, becomes the Mighty Thor. And this is a character from the comics. And I would say of the three movies that she's been in, um, Jane Foster is definitely utilized best here. And we see kind of a different side to her than we've seen before. She's very funny and like kind of awkward as well. And those things kind of go together in, in the way that it's portrayed in the movie. And it was a really fun side of Jane to see, for sure. And I definitely feel like it is the same character, but she's just kind of developed more over the years, being a, a, a renowned uh, physicist, astrophysicist. Um, and, you know, the ups and downs of, of life. Uh, so that was really cool. And she was a badass as well. With the hammer, she could do really cool things. Because it's the broken hammer from Ragnarok, the one that Hela destroyed, the hammer actually is able to like break apart and like throw the pieces as as separate pro pro projectiles, um, and then like form back together and into the the like physical you know singular uh, form. So that was really cool and a really cool way to use Mjolnir that we obviously never got to see before. So that was really badass as well. And then the next character that I'm going to mention is Korg. And I would say Korg, after what happened in Infinity War with Heimdall dying, has become um, Thor's like new best friend. And they're, they're like side by side through, through the whole journey that Thor takes um, since they've met each other. So... That's uh, pretty cool for both of them. And I would say in terms of his character, Korg is still funny in this movie. But he's not quite as much of a badass as he was in some of his best moments in the previous movies. Um, and that's pretty much all I have to say about him. Um, I did like him in this movie though. Uh, Valkyrie is the next one. And she's awesome as always. Um, but in this movie, I feel like she was a little bit underutilized. I love Tessa Thompson's portrayal of Valkyrie. She's like probably one of my favorite um, of the newer characters that at like at, at the end of Phase Three that was introduced then. Um, but I definitely want to see more of her than we got to see in this movie. And then after those four is the antagonist of the movie, Gore, the God Butcher. And I would say that he, played by Christian Bale, was a great villain. Kind of scary, but he was not used enough to like make it really scary, uh, except for maybe for kids. But there's a lot of like potential. Like you could see that it it wants to be something like super scary and like serious and kind of dark. But the movie kind of holds back on that. And all the creators of the movie are saying because they wanted it to be for kids, which is kind of understandable. But in my mind, like, if you're going to have a character like this, then go for it. Like, if you don't want to do that, have, have it be some a different character that's not quite as, like, twisted as this guy seemingly is under the surface. But we didn't get to see any of that stuff. So it was kind of like like a diluted version of him so that was a little bit unfortunate but Christian Bale definitely knocked it out of the park with everything he was able to do and the acting was phenomenal and I think he definitely is what sold the character if it was anybody else it might not have worked as well and I will say about his design like before the movie came out excuse me 
when they were first releasing marketing materials for the movie and we saw the first glimpse at Gore, I wasn't sure if I liked his design. In the trailer, it definitely looked better, but I still wasn't like exactly sure. But after seeing the actual movie, I actually do like his design a lot. I think he looks really cool, like I said before, scary. Um, and and, and the, the performance is definitely enhances the look for sure. Um, so I, I was happy with it. I, it was nothing that I was disappointed by, luckily. And then the last singular character that I'm going to mention is Zeus, the Greek god, because Gore is called the God Butcher. So this movie, he's hunting down gods from every pantheon, including the Greek pantheon. Um, so Zeus makes an appearance here for the first time in the MCU. And we learn that Thor is actually like inspired by Zeus. Zeus is an older god than he is. And... Uh, and he was great in this movie. Honestly, he, he's probably one of my favorite characters in the movie. Uh, played by Russell Crowe. I think he did a phenomenal job. Spot on performance for sure. Um, and this Zeus is from what I hear. Like more in line with the Zeus. From the actual Greek mythology. Um, and he's, his performance. Russell Crowe's performance. Uh, matches that. He's both goofy and intimidating at the same time but he's also like smarter than than he seems and like all that is conveyed through russell crowe's performance and we didn't get to see him much in the movie but it was enough for me to like be very uh interested in seeing him again and excited to see him again in the future because yeah like i said he, he was phenomenal uh for sure um the last group of people that i'm going to mention of course are the guardians of the galaxy and i would say unfortunately they're not really characters in this movie they're kind of an afterthought or like just a plot device in the beginning to i mean honestly not even a plot device really they're just uh they're just there like just because we saw that that's where thor ended on, the, on his last movie they're there in the beginning, but then they dip out, and that's it. Um, so they were really just used to transition them from Infinity War to the next Guardians of the Galaxy movie. But they didn't really serve as Thor's uh, story or journey in any way, in any significant way, um, unfortunately. So I was kind of bummed about that. That's probably the only thing I was really like disappointed about, if anything, in the movie. Um but there's no no point in like talking about any specific guardian member because just as a team they were just kind of there and then not there so that's all i'm going to say about that the next section i'm going to talk about is the action and i would say that the action overall was decent but there was no action sequence that really stood out to me um i am going to talk about specific ones in the movie and kind of say which ones i did like uh, compared to the other ones, but overall it was just kind of, kind of whatever, you know. So I would say the intro was probably definitely one of the standouts um, in the action, and this is when Thor is with the Guardians and he's saving the planet with them because that's what they do. They just go around, seeing who needs help, help them out, and Thor is actually the one that's carrying all the weight now. That he's he's the only one that has like crazy level of power. So that dynamic was kind of fun to see, um, and and it it definitely was a very '80s like kind of sequence, '80s like even like a kind of music video, I feel. Um, but that's all I'm gonna say about that. But this was definitely one of my favorite moments with the action. The next one is uh, when Gore's army attacks New Asgard, and we see this in the trailer. Um, this really just serves as um, a plot device to reunite Thor and Jane Foster and kind of kickstart the plot because um, this is what kind of leads them on their journey and, and their fight against Thor in, in the movie. Um, it was cool to see Jane for the first time 
and see like what she could do and we see this in this scene so all of that stuff was really cool um, after that is when uh, Thor, Jane, Korg, and Valkyrie go to what is called Omnipotent City. In the trailer, I thought it was uh, Mount Olympus, where the Greek gods reign, but it's actually a place where all the gods are free to go, kind of as like a getaway, like vacation spot or something. Um, so this is where we meet Zeus. And there's a fight between um, our protagonists and Zeus and his guards. And I think this sequence was was pretty decent. The the standout for me was definitely Valkyrie, like she was just having a blast, just being in combat, and just like wrecking shop. Um, so I think that was really fun for sure. And the location it looks really cool too, the design of it, and just the colors and everything. So visually, it was also a standout in the movie. And obviously, this is when we see Zeus. So Zeus uh, was a fun, fun character to see. And the next action sequence is one of the final battles against Gore. And this time, they faced him on his turf, which is the Shadow Realm, because Something that I didn't uh, mention before is that Gore has this like special weapon called the Necro Sword, um, and it's connected to the Shadow Realm, where like he could use shadows to create like monsters um, that that you know go out into battle for him, um, and he could also travel through shadows like teleport. Um, so when they go here. This sequence was really cool visually because there's no color, so everything turns into black and white. Um, and the only thing that we get to see is anything that produces any light because shadows are born from darkness. Um, well, they're... well, we know what shadows are. It, it's um, when light passes or hits an object and then the shadows cast it from the object. Um, so the only color that we see is anything that is produced by light here because it's it is kind of a dark realm but i i would say that this sequence was only cool on that surface level of just being the black and white and like being so, that being something that we don't see often especially in superhero movies um but it's on like a tiny little like rock floating in space so it just, it, it felt kind of weird because like literally they go around the rock. Like it's so small that they could go all the way around it. And the monsters, I don't know, I, they're like, it kind of reminded me of like one of those storybook um, things that are like, like, well, like a little light lamp where it is the shadow kind of telling a story when it spins around it kind of reminded me of something like that so it just kind of felt a little bit off as well um but like like i said visually it was cool so i liked it for that reason um but it was not one of my favorite moments in the movie and then the, f the final sequence uh takes place in the temple of the gods and this was a very cool location with cosmic implications we see a glimpse of it in the trailer as well but i don't want to say too much about it because it is kind of like spoilerish um but the fight that happens here it's itself was not like a standout i think just the location it's, it, itself is what uh really impressed me but there was one really cool moment of uh with thor um that almost matched the the level of excitement that i got from seeing thor realize his true power in Ragnarok without the use of Mjolnir um but it didn't quite hit that level for me um but it it was a it was a fun sequence so the next thing that I I would mention is the music of the movie and that's probably one of the best parts of the movie it had a great 80s uh soundtrack and um, and that's throughout the whole movie. It starts with that, 
this uh, sequence that I just mentioned had that. Uh, the ending, like credit song, is the one that was used in the trailers. That's a great song, and and throughout the movie. Unfortunately, though, there was no song for the Guardians like awesome mix for like Peter Quill. That is di diegetic, which means that it's part of the actual story, like happening in in world, um, where he plays it on his cassette player or his Zoom or whatever he had. Um, as far as I could tell, like none, there was nothing like that. That was definitely Star Lord playing music, um, but there was a soundtrack that played when the Guardians were there. So I don't know for sure, um, but I didn't get that sense. So. That was a little bit unfortunate as well. Because I was expecting since they were in this movie, there would be at least one track that we could add to the awesome mix. But I don't think there was. It was just non-diegetic uh, music. Um, and then the next thing I want to talk about is the romance aspect of the movie uh, between Thor and Jane. And it's definitely, I think, was done way better here than in any of the two previous films that had Jane Foster in it, which were the first Thor and Thor the Dark World. And this relationship was shown very efficiently and effectively in this movie with a montage that was set between the Dark World and um, before the events of Ragnarok, because that's when uh, Jane jumped Thor off screen. And yeah, like you feel from just this montage that that this relationship like you believe it that that they do love each other and that they grew out of love because a lot of people complained in the first two thor movies that that was one of the relationships that didn't really work for people like people didn't think that that uh, natalie portman and chris hemsworth had chemistry i personally didn't have a problem with it i definitely don't think it was one of the best ones like it, it didn't stand out as much but in the first movie Jane had a, a kind of like like awestruck feeling to her about Thor where she was kind of like um, you know birds in her eyes and all that type of thing so it's kind of like surface level like I feel like I don't know she was just um, impressed or admired like the idea of Thor but but didn't really like love him and I feel like he fell in love with her more so in that first movie. Um, but in the second movie, I think the relationship were, was better there. And I think I like Jane as a character better there. Because she was um, kind of more important to the story. And that's why this one is the best one. Because she's given the most uh, to do in this one. And all that stuff was really good. So I really like the romance uh, in this movie. So that's pretty much it for my non-spoiler part of the review. Um, so now I'm going to go into spoilers. And it's not going to be much, just a little bit. Um, but this is your last warning. So the first thing I'm going to talk about when it comes to spoilers is the Guardians of the Galaxy. And I will say that I was super disappointed with their use or lack of use in this movie. Um, because the way that they exit is that they say that they're going to split up to help more gods that are in need because of Gore's god butchery. Um, and um, so Thor go, goes to save Sif, who is with Thalagar the Behemoth, who we saw in the trailer. But because there are gods everywhere and Gore is killing them off, the people that worship these gods are like running into all these problems. So the guardians go to help them out. But what they should have done is like show them, you know, back going back and forth between the two and see what the guardians are doing, at least at one point in the movie, just to like catch up with them. But we never see that. Once they leave, they're just gone, never referred to, never seen again in the movie. So it was just super disappointing because Endgame set up a Thor Guardians adventure. We never got to see that adventure. Um, and kind of similar with with how they did with Jane, there was a bit of a montage with Thor's time with the Guardians. Um, but as opposed to the one with Jane, this one was not really satisfactory for me. 
And it sucked because we didn't even see any scenes with like Thor and Rocket or Groot, which was like kind of the main members of the Guardians that Thor interacted with in Infinity War and Endgame. So that relationship was not developed at all. Um, we do get the sense here that his relationship with Peter Quill has changed from the ending of Endgame. But we don't really know like how it changed or like why it's different. Um, but I will say that Quill seems to actually admire Thor now and seems a bit more mature around him. Thor seems a little bit more like the immature one still. Um, but whereas Peter Quill in Endgame, like they were kind of like always bickering back and forth, trying to be like the big man, the leader. Um, Quill, it just accepts the fact, or he knows that he is the leader of the Guardians. They will always follow him. But Thor is the muscle. Like Thor is the one that can handle his shit with no problem. And he actually like wants him to do that because he finds it very cool, which... Of course, it is cool. Everybody uh, loves a badass. Um, but that's kind of the extent of it. And and if you recall, in Guardians Volume 2, we find out that, that uh, Star-Lord is actually half celestial because his father, Ego, the living planet, was a celestial, which means he was a god. And Quill was a demigod. Um so it would it could have been interesting to see how Gore would have responded to Star Lord, knowing that information, even though at this point in his life he doesn't have powers because after he killed his father, his father is the one that really gave him his power, like literally, like a battery. So with him gone, Star Lord lost his powers, but he is technically still a demigod, and who knows? Maybe he does have some powers that he could access somewhere down deep down. Um, but we obviously never got to see that because Gore never crossed paths with the Guardians at all. So, like, they could have done so many cool things with the Guardians, but Taika just decided to, like, no, nah, fuck the Guardians. I'm, I want to just do my thing. Ragnarok 2 with the characters that he introduced there. And even, like, Sif, who comes back in this movie, didn't do anything. So, it's kind of pointless. Like, I'm glad that she didn't die. Like, the Warriors 3, who Taika fucking hates. He killed them like nothing in Ragnarok. Thor never even mentioned them. And in the beginning, Korg does a recap showing their deaths. And he, he just he, does, he doesn't give them any respect. He doesn't call them by, by, by their names. Um, so that was kind of, kind of something I was annoyed by in both movies. But I'm glad that Sif does come back and she does stay alive. Because that means there is room for her to do something in the future. But I also would have liked to have seen it now in this movie. Um, but we didn't see that. And they could have at least shown the scene of when she was attacked by Gore. And she lost her arm. And like trying to protect Falagar the Behemoth that he killed. Uh, but we didn't see that either. And that seems to be kind of a major trend with this movie. That is really kind of annoying that a lot of the stuff that could have been in the movie, stuff that they shot is just cut out and, and we might not even see it on the deleted scenes when the movie is released on Disney Plus or Blu-ray or anything. Um, so that's just like unfortunate, but I mean, what could we, what could you do? Um, but if you do want to know more about like some of the ideas that, that they kind of Drop the ball with with the Guardians in particular in this movie. Um, I will link a article that I read that got me thinking about it more um, down below in the description. So you could check that out. Uh, it's really good. The next thing that I want to talk about with spoilers is the the Jane Foster cancer story. And I'll say this definitely is the heart of the movie. Um. I feel like the way that it was handled was okay. I feel like it, it could have been better, but considering this is a movie, they had to kind of like make it a really kind of fast thing that just happens. Um, whereas in the comics, I feel like the story probably w was able to breathe more and you get to like kind of really feel the weight of it. 
whereas in this one you don't and it's it's partially because of the like contrasting tones in this movie like the the, the jane stuff is the more like grounded like emotional part of the story but then there's all this like dumb humor that is also happening and i feel like the humor worked better in ragnarok than it did here but i i do kind of know why thor has become a comedic character and i do like the reason why but I definitely think it's kind of overdone sometimes, especially with Taika Waititi. Um, but basically, Thor, and then in, in this movie as well, Jane, they use humor to kind of uh, deal with their emotions in a comfortable way for them. It's like, it's kind of like a coping mechanism, I think. Like, they crack jokes so that they won't have to feel how they feel. Um negative feelings um but i definitely think the the jane stuff could have been told a little bit better um if it was handled in a different way but one thing that i was surprised by is that she actually died from the cancer in this movie like i did not see that coming at all i didn't think that they would um like bring Jane back into the MCU just to kill her off. Like, I thought she would have been, like, become the Mighty Thor in this movie and then go off uh, as, like, you know, two different Thors in the MCU going forward. Thor Odinson and then her. But, but now she just dies from the cancer, which was crazy. Like, I'm kind of glad that they did it. And this movie, with that, like, revelation, served as, like, a... A farewell to Jane. Um, whether we see her again in the future, I don't know. Uh, with the whole multiverse thing, and where I think the MCU is going with like Secret Wars, which will bring the multiverse together, she could show up from an alternate universe. Um, but in the main MCU timeline, like she's just dead, and that's it. So I was I was surprised by that. With that, it was cool in the last post credit scene seeing the entrance of Valhalla. Yet another MCU afterlife that we actually get to see. And I also did not expect that either. I was hoping that we would see that. Um, given the the field of reads that we got to see in Moon Knight and the revelation there that where you go after you die depends on your beliefs. Like the Wakandans... Um, the ancestral plane is a, a form of the afterlife for them, um, where they get to go see their ancestors, um, and that's where they go when, when they die, and with the tree and everything. Um, but yeah, but I didn't expect to actually see it, so that was really cool, and then seeing Heimdall greet um, Jane as well, and we know that they know each other because they met in the Dark World. So that was really cool as well. Um, kind of going with that too, is that Heimdall has a son, which I didn't see that coming either. Uh, and it was kind of crazy to have that revelation because we never heard of him or seen him in anything before. Um, so that was kind of a interesting and kind of cool reveal um, for sure. It's cool that he has Heimdall's powers. Um, so in a way, he's kind of like a resurrected Heimdall. He'll probably serve as the gatekeeper for new Asgard going forward. But when it comes to the deaths, um, there was another one that was like a close death that could have happened. And I think it should have happened, uh, and it was with Korg. When they were in Omnipotent City, Zeus was getting mad, and he threw his thunderbolt straight through Korg. And it made his body start falling apart. And I thought that was it. I thought he was done because the way the way that it was happening, it would have been a very impactful death, I think. Because it was like it was just shocking. Like it just happened out of nowhere. Um But then, as always, Taika subverted a dramatic scene or or a possibly emotional scene with humor. And 
we find out he is still alive, that all a Cronin needs is their like face pretty much. And if they have if that's intact, they could just like bring their body back with more rocks. Um so I don't know, like it was fine, but I feel like if anybody was gonna die in this movie, that death would have been the best death. Cause even Jane, like she died from the cancer, she didn't die in battle or anything like that. Um, so it was not really a, a sad scene for me when she died, especially with everything that was happening as well, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but. Korg's death would have been sad. There was another close call with Valkyrie, and I'm glad she didn't die because she they she was not used nearly enough for her to die in this movie. And there's a lot more I think that she could do in the future. So I'm happy that she did not die. Um, but they benched her for the final battle because she got hurt in the Shadow Realm um, sequence. And then going back to the like humor that kind of gets in the way of the drama a lot in Taika's movies, and his Thor movies specifically, um, is that he had another scene of the like new Asgard theater that um, Loki put on in Ragnarok when he was king, when Odin was, was banished or whatever. Um, but I feel like it didn't work as well here as it did in Ragnarok. Like in Ragnarok, I thought it was kind of dumb, but... It made sense with Loki being the ruler at the time of Asgard. Um, but here, Loki's obviously gone. He's dead. He died in Infinity War. So unless, like, the only reason why it's still going on is, be is like, as a tribute to Loki, I don't know why it's even a thing again. But... Um, I feel like... This scene didn't work as well. It wasn't as funny. But also, it foreshadowed something in this movie that shouldn't have been foreshadowed because it made the, the it made it clear to the audience who, who was paying attention that the writing was kind of lazy because it was a repeat of something that happened in Ragnarok. And they show that scene through the theater performance in this movie happened there and it's um in ragnarok when hella is first uh like shown to us and thor and loki like see her for the first time loki freaks out and he, and he tells um whoever's in control of the bifrost i think it was scourge at the time to to take them home but because of that hell is able to go, go directly to asgard which is where she gets her power from um, and then, uh, Thor and Loki get split up. Um, so it was a bad mistake on Loki's part. And some, so a similar, a similar thing happens here where in that Shadow Realm battle, because Valkyrie gets injured, they have to retreat. Um, and Thor could use Stormbreaker to summon the Bifrost. So he does that to go home, but we find out that the, the Stormbreaker or the Bifrost is needed for Gore's uh, like goal, which is to get to Eternity, because at Eternity's like wishing well, um, you can make oh, any wish and Eternity will grant it to the first person that makes it there, and nobody seems to have made it there in all this time. But uh, he needs the Bifrost in order in order to like open the the, the doorway, and. As soon as they're like dipping out, Gore gets Stormbreaker. He gets a hold of the handle, and he he gets it from Thor. And Thor goes goes away through the Bifrost. Um, so this is it was just a repeat of the same thing that happened. So I feel like because of that, the writing was a little bit lazy uh, on Taika's part or whoever wrote that scene. Um, and like they kind of dug a hole for themselves, including the Ragnarok flashback to that same moment. Um, but I only noticed this on the second time watching it. I just didn't like the theater scene the first time. But I will say what, what was cool about that um, Eternity scene 
with the temple of the gods is that is that we see not just eternity, but seeing eternity was crazy. I, I didn't expect that either. Um, we also see statues of other like supreme cosmic beings in the Marvel Universe, including a Watcher, uh, who we see in What If with the multiverse, how the Watcher appears into different universes, alternate timelines to the main MCU uh, 616 sacred timeline. Um, and we see a statue of the Living Tribunal, which we also saw in Loki in the void. Um, so maybe this, maybe that statue actually came from this place in a prone timeline. Who knows? I don't, I don't know. But um, that was cool. We also saw, uh, I think from, from an Eric Voss video, he broke it down. Um, infinity, infinity is another cosmic being, uh, death, um, we saw a celestial who, according to Eric Voss, is the one above all, who is literally the number one supreme being in the Marvel Universe, but I didn't know this until Eric Voss's video, that he has a celestial form. And it was also called, cool seeing two celestials in Omnipotent City when they were leaving. Um, they were just standing outside of like the windows there. Uh, so that was pretty cool as well. Um, I do wish that we saw some more of the backstory with the Necrosword. Because in the comics, the Necrosword um, originates, I believe, from Null, who is the god of the symbiotes. And he used the Necrosword to actually kill the Celestial whose head we see in the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie. And then again in Infinity War. Um, so it would have been cool to see actually see that. Even if it wasn't like gore. Because they did I think kind of change that for this movie. Because the Venom movies have the symbiotes. And that's a whole different separate universe from the MCU. But it would have been cool like at least hearing about it or seeing a version of that. I do think that the opening scene with gore and his origin was cool. Um, but it would have been cool seeing something else as well. And even just seeing him butcher more gods. Like, we don't actually see him murder really any any gods except for that first one. Um, so that was also disappointing in the, in the movie as well. But, like, when it comes to the Living Tribunal, we, we've never seen this version of the Living Tribunal. In Multiverse of Madness, when Doctor Strange and America, like, travel through all the universes, the very first one they see is a version of the Living Tribunal where it's like three separated heads. But in the main universe, it's three heads together that kind of represent the three levels or stages of justice. <laughs> um, blind justice, where there's a veil over the eyes of one of the heads of the Living Tribunal. And then there's... Uh, I, don't, I actually don't know what the other two represent. I forgot from the top of my head. I'm, I'm not sure. I guess I could look it up right now really quick. Oh, so they actually represent equity, necessity, and vengeance. So equity is probably the one that, that's blind, blind justice. It's equal because you don't see, there's no bias. Um, and then necessity is the other one, and vengeance. Um, like revenge is a form of justice that some people believe in. Um, and then there's necessity, right? I don't know what that one would be. I guess it's kind of what's demanded by the people. Um, but I don't know. The last thing that I want to talk about is the first post credit scene. And that one we see that um, previously in the Omnipotent City, it ends with uh, Thor throwing Zeus's Thunderbolt back at him because he's angry um, at what he thought was uh, Korg's death. And it goes straight through Zeus. And we think Zeus died because he falls down. It goes like literally straight through the middle of him. But we find out in the postcard scene that he's actually alive. His Zeusettes, as they're credited in, in the credits, are like... Um, patching up his wound. Um, and he, he does like a monologue. And he's talking, we see to Hercules, his son, who's a, a demigod, 
Um, and he's asking him to basically get revenge for for Thor fucking shit up for Zeus. Because Zeus was like the supreme god. But he's like basically made a fool of by Thor in front of all the other gods. Um, so this scene introduces Hercules, who is a Marvel character in the comics who I have seen before. And I think they got his look exactly right in this movie. And I'll show you how he looked in the comics uh, to compare. Um, but I, for one, actually am excited to see some of that. Um, to see some more of the Greek gods and Greek mythology in the MCU. Because I'm a sucker for all types of mythologies. I loved the Egyptian mythology in Moon Knight. Seeing more of this side will be really cool as well. And from what I know or like have heard about Hercules in the Marvel Universe, he's like like his dad, the way he was portrayed here, very much a fucking asshole and like kind of cocky. Um, so I think him and Thor are, are going to be an interesting dynamic for sure. And I don't think that they'll stay stay enemies. Like they might start off as enemies, but, th but then they might like actually kind of get along a little bit. And I think that would be interesting as well. Because Zeus, like, I think hates Thor after this movie. Um, so I, I, I'm down for whatever they're planning on doing with that. Whether it's a Thor 5 movie, Thor versus Hercules. Or if they're in something else and, like, an ensemble movie. I don't mind either way. Um, but like I said at the beginning, I feel like Thor, it, it seems to be at, like, a, an ending place here. Because when Gore does make it to Eternity... And gets to that like alternate realm, wherever Eternity's realm is. It's like kind of reminded me of the soul, the soul realm, where it's just water, but instead of like an orange uh, background, it's it's like just a clear sky background, and there's water on the ground, and it's very beautiful and like kind of serene, with with Eternity actually like literally um, meditating. Um, Jane, through her love, kind of uh, pushes Thor to to like kind of give up his his fight with Gore, and to just choose the person he loves and be with them in, in their dying moment. Because Jane, um, from using Mjolnir, destroyed all the chemotherapy that she was undergoing for her cancer, so the cancer actually like got worse. So. After she's like forced to use it because she feels Thor being beat by um, Gore in that chamber before making it to eternity. She summons the Mjolnir and, and gets there um, to save him. But that's a, a death sentence for her. So Thor chooses to be with her instead of continuing to fight him. But Thor uh, convinces Gore that a better wish instead of deciding to use his wish to just make all gods die and choosing hate is to choose love and like he could actually choose to be with his daughter again and similar to Jane the only thing keeping Gore alive was the necrosword but him and Thor uh, him and Thor and, and, and Jane destroyed the necrosword so he was also going to die so what he decides to do is he does bring his daughter back, but he's like, she's going to be alone. Like, what would I do if, if she's by herself? And Jane's the one that's like, has the idea, like, Thor could adopt her and watch over her. And the first time I watched the movie, I, I didn't think Jane was going to die. I thought they were both going to watch her as an adopted family. With Thor and Jane as the mom, and was well, the dad and the mom. But Jane dies, so it's only Thor. So she started off the movie, um, Gore's daughter, with just a father. And she ends the movie coming back to life with just a father. But now it's her adopted father, Thor Odinson. Um, and that was really cool because that was a different type of love. It's fatherly love. And Thor now gets a chance to do fatherhood better than his dad ever did. Um, and it's actually kind of interesting now that, I th now that I think about it. That it's uh, his first, like, born or his first child is also a girl, just like Odin's was. But he fucked up real bad with Hela, um, as we saw in Ragnarok. So that's kind of another 
interesting contrast that we could see more of in the future. And I, I really like the ending with that and kind of where the title actually comes from. And this girl, I don't know if Thor names her this or if she was already named that or if Eternity chose to just em embody this like um, abstract idea, but she's known as Love. So the title comes from Love being the girl and Thunder being Thor. And they create a new legend. Uh, so I, I really like the way that they ended that. That was really cool. Then the logo shows up. It's really 80s and, and stylized and, and badass. And the song plays Sweet Child of Mine, which also makes sense now. Sweet Child of Mine is Gore's daughter at first and then Thor's daughter at the end. Um, and and even there's some of that too with uh, with Jane and her mom because we find out that cancer was genetic. Um, Jane's mom also died of cancer when Jane was just a, a young girl. Um, so back in that flashback that we saw there, Jane was the sweet child of, the, of her mother. Um, so I really like the ending with that. Um, and I can't wait to see what happens next. But it's cool seeing Thor as a father. I know he's had a daughter in other versions. Like there's a couple of animated movies, Avengers movies that I watched as a kid called, um, I think it was just Ultimate Avengers and the Ultimate Universe. Um, there was two movies, and then there was like a, a sequel that happened way down the line with all the Avengers kids. And in that movie, Thor had a daughter uh, there, so so that was really cool. And he gives her Stormbreaker, and he uses Mjolnir now that it's back. Um, and I believe in that next Avengers movie, she does have like a big kind of more axe-style hammer uh, as well. And I actually think the MCU, a lot of it is based off of the Ultimate Universe, so it makes sense. Like in that uh, first Avengers, uh, Ultimate Avengers animated movie, um, Thor was like a Viking who just like kind of drank beer. Like the like beer was his gift from mortals to this god. Um, and that was like kind of the Thor that was portrayed in Endgame. Uh, so that was also kind of funny, but it was kind of a side thing. But uh, yeah, overall, like I, I like this movie. Uh, my score did drop down from my first viewing to my second viewing from, I think, like an 8.5 down a whole point to 7.5 the second time. I didn't like it as much the second time. I feel like this movie overall won't be as like memorable as Ragnarok. Um, but I am excited to see where it's going to go in the future. Um, like, I am still down to see more Thor uh, if they are willing to give it to us. And at the end, they do say Thor will return. So, whatever it happens, I'm down. I'm game for it. And the main reason why my score changed is because I was kind of, like, comparing my feelings about this movie to Multiverse of Madness. And at first, I think I liked it better than Multiverse of Madness, but... I think it's because I had I didn't have really any expectations for it, whereas Multiverse of Madness I did, and they didn't meet my expectations, which is why I didn't like it originally. But actually, the more I've watched Multiverse of Madness and like accepted what it is and not what I wanted it to be, I have actually liked it more and more every time. But this one I didn't have any expectations, so I liked what we got. Like I had a, a fun time watching it. But watching it again, it, it wasn't as good. Like, it, it's not going to be as rewatchable, I think, for me, which is why the score went down. And I, I do think Multiverse of Madness did a lot of really cool things that this movie didn't really, like, do much that was impressive. Um, especially compared to Taika's previous Thor movie, Ragnarok, which I think did do a lot of cool stuff, like, visually. This movie didn't stand out as much. The cinematography wasn't anything special. The action wasn't anything special. There was no like real hype moment. The one that I told you earlier was um, in the chamber with the with the gods. Um, Thor 
bestows his power onto onto the kids that he saves that were kidnapped by Gore in the beginning. And they all are able to fight, um, you know, so that they're not helpless. And that part was cool, but it wasn't as cool as the immigrant song from Ragnarok and that sequence when he uh, unleashes his full power upon Hela and her, her forces. So even that, like, was kind of wanting to replicate, but it, it didn't uh, didn't succeed at it for me. Um, so... Yeah, so that so that's that's all for my review. Um, so my final score is a seven point five out of ten because my score for Multiverse of Madness changed as well. I guess I'll tell you what my score is for that now, and that one actually moved up to an eight out of ten. So this is point five below, um, and I would say actually a lot of the recent. MCU stuff has kind of fallen in a similar ranking for me in like the bottom middle tier of all of the MCU movies. And my next review will be one for Miss Marvel. And that one is, is just slightly better than Love and Thunder for me. Um, after that is like the next up is Falcon and the Winter Soldier and then Multiverse of Madness for me. So all those movies go kind of back to back. But that's all I'm going to say now here. Uh, I hope you enjoyed my review. Um, go ahead and check the movie out for yourself. See what you think. See if you agree or disagree with me, what I'm saying. Um, but I hope you do enjoy it. And I'll see you next time. Peace.